My name is Jennifer Luther. I'm the project manager at the Stoops Center for Community Families and Children, Florida State University College of Social Work. And we've been doing quite a bit of work in the area of substance use disorder treatment interventions, particularly around child welfare. So we wanted to, um, to dive into that topic with this really tricky part of it, which is um, basically uh, how do we think about cannabis in, in the frame of that? So uh, I'll just start by introducing you, Dr. Ray, and then I'll let you take it from there. That's perfect. Um, so uh, we have with us um, Dr. Ray, who has received her um, bachelor's of science degree in psychology and her PhD in neuroscience from Washington State University. Um, there she focused on pain relieving pro properties of opioids and cannabinoids. AD followed up on this training by taking a postdoctoral position at Sydney University in Australia, where she was awarded the National Research Service Award from National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. And she was awarded that to study the SNAPS physiology of cannabinoids and opioids. Um, she continued her postdoctorate training at Columbia University, and there she was able to broaden her expertise to include a dynamic interaction between drug abuse and chronic pain. Um, in 19, uh, in, I'm sorry, 2019, she joined Legacy Research Institute, and there she uses translational and clinical research appro approaches to further characterize the analgesic and harm-reducing properties of cannabis in the context of opioid use. So with that, I will kick it over to you, AD, and we look forward to going on this journey with you. Thank oh, you also, so much. I should, say, I should say one thing before you get started. If you have questions, you can chat to us as hosts, and then we're going to save up your questions, and we'll have a couple of time, times during our webinar today for those to be asked of AD, and um, we will also take a, a 10-minute break about halfway through, so you can be prepared for that. So once again, I'll hand it over to you, AD. Thank you so much. It's really nice to be with you all so early in the morning. It's, you know, obviously very dark outside here on the West Coast and very rainy. I'm speaking to you today from what is now called Portland, Oregon, which is the traditional village sites along the Willamette and Columbia rivers of the many groups of people, including the Multnomah, the Kathlamet, the Malala, Western bands of the Chinook, Kalapuya, and many other folks whose names have been lost to time. Um, my name is Dr. Adi Ray. I use she, her, and dude pronouns. I'm an assistant scientist here at Legacy Research Institute. LRI is part of our larger hospital, hospital system, Legacy Health. Um, I also hold an appointment at Washington State University, which is my alma mater. Um, let's see. So um, as Jen mentioned, you know, my research has really, um, most of my time has been focused on how we can use opioids, or, or rather how we can use cannabis and cannabinoids to reduce the harms of opioids, mostly in the context of chronic pain. Um, my work spans a whole wide range of methods, you know, all the way from behavioral pharmacology and rodents, um, up to, you know, large scale observational studies in humans and some interventional studies in humans as well. Um, in addition to my academic roles, you know, I've held uh, positions in the Cannabinoid Research Society, um, the ICRS, and I've been a longtime member of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians as well. Um, and I play lots of roles in public service. I've served um, as an advisor to the, um, our regulatory agencies for several years. Um, so as my, uh, in my role as the vice chair of the Oregon Cannabis Commission, my role is to advise the Oregon Health Authority and our other agencies on evidence-based practices for regulating cannabis. Um, I also work very closely with the OHA, our, our health authority, um, to disseminate education about cannabis. Um, so there's a number of other um, 
you know, uh, public service roles that I've held uh, advising federal agencies and federal lawmakers. I've worked closely with our soon to be retired uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, who's been a really uh, amazing advocate for cannabis over the years. And I've helped with some state level uh, legalization um, efforts as well. Um, I'd also like to disclose that I have accepted industry funding for consulting projects, mostly around, again, uh, public education, writing blog posts for the lay people, um, and doing some experiential research. Um, also, disclosure, I'm a mom. <laughs> um, my kiddo is now 10. Um, and so all of these topics that I'll be talking about today are very close to my heart. You know, I grew up in the era of drug abuse resistance education or the D.A.R.E. program. Um, you know, for as many as as well intentioned as that program was, there were a lot of shortcomings. Um, and it's really important that my kid grow up in a different environment where she's empowered with information at a young age um, because kids do have a lot of agency to make choices. So it's important for me to um, disseminate evidence-based education um, in a way that's supportive of kids and families. So the first half of the talk today is going to be just basic information about cannabis. Then after our break, we'll get more into how all of that information interfaces with uh, parents and, and the child welfare system. So I'd like to step back a little bit and talk about how long cannabis has been used as a medicine on this planet, which is more than 5,000 years. So that dates back all the way to the Chinese pharmacopoeia, the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans all used cannabis for pain relief. And it was even a mainstream medicine in every American pharmacy through the 1800s. When things started to shift was about 1910. So um, in the exact same way that we now have state-by-state -state cannabis legalization, at that time we had state-by-state -state cannabis prohibition. So that process started in 1910. And then in 1930s, um, there became this really aggressive push, uh, mostly by Henry Anslinger, who is the, the nation's first drug czar, um, there became a, a really overt um, propaganda effort um, uh, spreading disinformation about cannabis, not actual information about cannabis, which then led to the Marijuana Tax Act, which effectively uh, prohibited cannabis throughout uh, the U.S. Um, and then, um, you know, President Nixon took up the reins and, um, you know, pretty much since Nixon took office until about 2015, um, DEA agents were actively seizing, um, you know, uh, what what in, at that time were actually legal cannabis operations, at least in California, they were legal at the state level. Um, so, you know, in 1996, that's when compassionate use for patients started to happen. So California was the first to do that in 1996, where I live in Oregon, it was shortly thereafter in 1998. So I'm mentioning all of this because, you know, it's it's helpful to step back and think about, you know, we've had 5,000 years of medical use of cannabis and 86 years of illegal use of cannabis. So um, this is a, an opportunity for a brief poll. So I'm presenting these two images to you, and I'd like you to guess if it is hemp or cannabis, and they are the same. So you can either guess hemp or cannabis. So I'd like to open up the poll to see, see what you think. Polls are coming in. This is really fun. So I can tell you that the picture on the left, these are both from recent field research trips of mine. The picture on the left, is um, coming in from Yakima, Washington. Um, and the picture on the right is coming from um, Sonoma Valley, California. Um, so I think it's a good time to end the poll. Um, and basically whatever you guessed, you're correct. Because there is no botanical difference between hemp and cannabis, right? Um, the only thing that makes a difference between hemp and cannabis is humans legal definition. So hemp is one variety of cannabis. It happens to be a variety of cannabis that has um, uh, l very low THC levels. And I'm gonna pause here just a moment. Can you guys see these weird yellow lines across my, my screen share? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I do. I don't know I what happened there. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to reshare my screen. I'm not sure where that came from. All right, that should sort us out. So hemp is just a legal definition um, for one, you know, one um, chemical makeup of cannabis. It happens to be cannabis, which contains in the U.S. 0.3 uh, THC, 0.3% uh, THC or less. And that legal definition is obviously arbitrary. So other regions around the world have a different definition of hemp. So for example, in Switzerland and the EU, UK, they draw the line at one or 2%. Um, but in general, hemp is considered a variety of cannabis that contains very low levels of THC. Um, marijuana is often a, use that's, uh, a term that's used interchangeably with the word cannabis, um, but that's problematic because it's scientifically inaccurate and it has some roots and some um, overt attempts to racialize the word during the drug war. Um, there are some other kinds of you know, ways that we can refer to cannabis plants, so, such as THC cannabis or high THC cannabis, CBD cannabis or high CBD cannabis, sometimes also known as hemp. What's really important, though, is that, um, you know, products like Delta 8 THC, HHC, THCP, there's like, you know, probably 20 or 30 different new cannabinoids, which have all flooded the market. Those also all come from the cannabis plant. And what's really important to note is that most of the things you're seeing on the screen right now, they're all legal at the federal level because they come from hemp. So, you know, last, I think it was March, I was in Florida. Um, you know, um, I had the honor to speak at um, the university and, you know, in my drive from the Tampa Bay area up to Tallahassee, I saw more Delta 8 vape shops than I could count. And um, what's really important to note is that Delta 8 in particular um, has all the exact same effects as Delta 9 THC. Um, so there's really no botanical difference between Delta-8 and, and Delta-9. They're molecular cousins. Um, the only difference between them is one of them is, has been determined by humans to be illegal, and the other one has been determined by humans to be legal. So the other important thing about cannabis is that we tend to lump it all into one, under one umbrella and say, you know, cannabis has been shown to be effective for pain or cannabis has been shown to reduce spasms in people with MS. But what's really interesting is that cannabis isn't one thing. It's not one medication. It's not one drug. It is a package for lots of other chemicals, all of which can have really important and meaningful biological effects and, and medical effects inside of our bodies. So that begs the question, how do all of these chemicals work inside of our body? Well, the way that they work is by interacting with our body's own endogenous cannabinoid system. So our endocannabinoid system um, was, it's really the, the, um, the target for all of the molecules that are, that are packaged inside the cannabis plants. Um, what's really interesting about this system is that it wasn't discovered until the 1990s. So if you think about in science and medicine, how long they've been studying the circulatory system or vision or, you know, um, the, uh, cardiovascular system or, you know, our various organs, you know, medicine has had hundreds of years of, of study to understand how all of these systems in our body work, including neuroscience. Um, but we, we didn't even know that the system existed until the 1990s. And so, you know, for that reason, this field of research is really, really far behind lots of other areas of, of science and medicine. What we do know about it so far is that it appears to be critical for our body maintaining homeostasis. And homeostasis is just the balance of our systems. When are we hungry? When do we feel satiety? When are we sleepy? When do we feel alert? When are we stressed? When do we feel calm? When is our body ready to reproduce and when is it not? All of these types of functions and many more are all regulated by our body's own endogenous cannabinoid system. So just like the molecules in cannabis, our body makes molecules that interact with these certain receptors or certain targets, the cannabinoid receptors. So the way that that works is both molecules from the plant and molecules from um, it made inside of our bodies, they bind to certain targets to activate effects. 
So those targets are mostly the cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. Most CB1 receptors are found in the brain, and that's how they exert their effects. Most CB2 receptors are found um, you know, in our immune system, for, for lack of a better word. They're also found in our brain as well. But a, a lot of the sort of anti-inflammatory and other kinds of effects that um, cannabinoids exert um, happen at CB2 receptors that are just floating around in our bloodstream. Um, I should note, though, again, this is a, a relatively recently discovered field. And so we're learning all the time that the cannabinoids don't just have these two targets where they're, you know, um, producing their effects. There's lots of other targets and the list is growing every day. Hey, can I ask a quick question here? Because sure. I think it's important and it kind of blew me away. If you go back two slides, um, you'll, you, you're at the, how it works. How does it work? Mm -hmm. And when you first started delivering this slide, you said that this word, and I don't know that I would know what the word means. And so maybe other people don't. Endogenous cannabinoid, mm -hmm. endocannabinoid system. And what I understood this to mean from my like not being a, a medical doctor or neuroscientist um, little frame of reference was we're actually born with receptors specific to this. Can you just say a little bit more to make yeah. that more clear for your average person out there? Absolutely. So endogenous, endo meaning inside, exo meaning outside. So exogenous cannabinoids come from outside of our bodies. Endogenous cannabinoids are made inside of our bodies. So, you know, our, our, our bodies make these, you know, um, these particular uh, chemicals, anandamide and 2-AG, um, those are just two of the most well-known cannabinoids. And those things are synthesized and they, you know, move through, um, you know, the, the gaps in between our brain cells and they bind to their targets, mostly the CB1 receptor, CB2 receptor, but lots of others. And our body has its own way of making cannabinoids, specifically endogenous cannabinoids, that is cannabinoids made inside of our body. And that's how our body uses these molecules as tools to regulate stress and memory and metabolism and pain and all kinds of other functions. They are messengers inside our bodies telling our brain what to do. We are born with those and we don't need any other outside plant to have them be happening already. Correct. However, this system is really delicate and very nuanced and sometimes it can go wrong. And so mm -hmm. it's a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but there is something called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. So it's thought that a lot of immune disorders like lupus and um, fibromyalgia, migraine even, that those, those um, diseases result when this system becomes dysregulated. So, you know, that's, that's a, a, a whole other Thank bucket you. of worms to get into. Yeah, but, no, but I appreciate, yeah. I very much appreciate you just pausing there and I'll, I'll let mm -hmm. you continue. But I think that that's kind of an important piece to understand when we're trying to understand this, this space. So thank you. Yeah. And you know, I think it's a good point too, because it speaks to, okay, if you have a vitamin deficiency, what do you do? You take those vitamins. If you have an iron deficiency, what do you do? You take iron. If you have an endocannabinoid deficiency, what do you do? You take cannabinoids, right? So it kind of makes sense in, in the context of why people find medical benefit from cannabis. If their internal system has been dysregulated, this can be one way which cannabis is helping re-regulate their bodies. Okay. So I want to give some really basic information about the two main ways that people consume cannabis, um, which is by consuming it orally or ingesting it and inhaling it. So these are, um, I, I bring these two up in particular because not only are they linked with um, the medical benefits that people experience from cannabis, but they can also be linked with the impairing effects of cannabis. 
So when people swallow cannabis, it takes a while for the effects to start. And it depends on the person. And it also depends on how recently they ate a meal. Um, But generally, most people will feel the effects of, of cannabis. And specifically, what they're feeling is the effects of THC. So THC or Delta 9 THC or Delta 8 THC. Um, this molecule is the primary molecule which causes impairment. So that's the inability for people to think clearly um, or for them to have proper body coordination. Um, so when you swallow cannabis, it takes 30 to 90 minutes for it to start um, start feeling the effects. But then those effects last a, a very long time, up to 12 hours in some people. Um, and of course, the more THC a person consumes, the more intense those are going, those feelings are. But there is a lot of inter-individual variability, especially with, um, with uh, products that are swallowed. And that's because these products, when they're swallowed, are processed by the liver. And the liver takes Delta-8 or Delta-9 THC and turns it into an even stronger molecule. And then that stronger molecule, 11-OH or 11-Hydroxy, that is also floating around inside our brain, activating our CB1 receptors. And that's what's causing changes in mood and, um, um, you know, uh, altered states of consciousness. Um, What patients find particularly useful with oral or ingested products is, you know, because they last so long, they often report that they're really good for helping them sleep. Um, So inhalation is the other method that's um, the most common way that humans consume cannabis around the world. The two devices that I have pictured here are um, non-smoking alternatives to inhaling cannabis, and these are both Uh, very popular ways that that both patients and consumers use cannabis, either by inhaling um, the the whole uh, plant or the whole flower, um, which is the the black device that you see there. It's basically an oven. It heats up the product and all of the molecules um, evaporate and then they can be inhaled. Um, Or uh, manufacturers will take the raw cannabis plant, extract all of the useful molecules out of it to make an oil, that oil is put into a vaporizer pen or a cartridge, and then that can be inhaled. So patients find benefit from inhalation because it starts working immediately. The molecules go from the outside of your body, they pass through your lungs, and they go straight up to your brain in the freshly oxygenated blood. So in the same way that the effects of nicotine or tobacco are felt immediately, the effects of inhaled uh, cannabis are, are felt immediately. The other thing about inhalation is that the duration of those effects is much shorter than when people are consuming them orally, usually about two to four hours. So I once was um, chatting with a judge in Missouri. Um, I used to uh, live and work in Missouri. And, you know, we were talking about how she had some concerns about parents who were smoking, you know, while they were, um, you know, had parenting duties. And, you know, um, she wasn't really, she, she was okay with the fact that, you know, a parent could consume an edible. She was really opposed to smoking. But when we had this conversation about, well, if a parent consumes an edible, they could be impaired for almost 12 hours. Whereas with um, inhalation, you know, it's a much shorter duration. And um, the other thing with edibles is it's a lot easier to overdose. So, you know, the the effects are a lot less predictable. You never really know um, exactly, you know, how impaired you might feel when you eat an edible. Um, so it's it's a lot less difficult to predict what's going to happen with oral products than it is with inhalation. Um, it's very easy for a patient to take one inhalation, see how they feel, take another inhalation, and stop. And that's that's a very common behavior. Most people, you know, they they take exactly what they want to feel the effects they need, um, which again are dose dependent. Right? The more the more um, inhalations a person takes, the stronger the effects are going to be. Um, but you know, patients find this really, really helpful, especially for intense pain where they can't wait 30 to 90 minutes for the the onset of pain relief. So, you know, there's some obvious concerns, just like with tobacco smoke, that um, there could be some detrimental effects either in the environment, um, that's third-hand smoke, or directly as a result of other people inhaling second-hand smoke. Of course, the other people we're most concerned about are children. Um, 
The problem right now is that we have some mixed evidence in terms of how safe or unsafe secondhand smoke is in, um, in humans. Um, so there's some things about cannabis smoke that are similar to tobacco smoke. You know, both of the, the, the composition of the smoke itself is pretty similar. There's hundreds of chemicals. Some of them are carcinogens, which are, are cancer causing molecules. Um, you know, uh, kids are more susceptible to viral colds if they live in a house where there is either cannabis smoke or tobacco smoke. Um, and there seems to be some interaction um, where kids who come from tobacco smoking homes are more likely to have THC in their urine. Um, and that could just be because people who smoke tobacco are also more, more likely to smoke um, cannabis. So, you know, there are some similarities there. Where cannabis difference uh, differs from tobacco is that, you know, tobacco has really gnarly effects on the cardiovascular system and cannabis um, does not. So there's no evidence that it causes um, heart attack, stroke, or lung cancer. Um, you know, uh, tobacco smoke is infamous for causing lung cancer and that link simply has not been shown. At least it hasn't been shown yet. Um, and there, there have been some case reports of anaphylaxis. So this is kind of like a severe peanut allergy. And those are happening in adolescents who already have severe allergies. So this might be something to think about if there is a kiddo that happens to have a peanut allergy or some other really severe allergy um, to plants or foods, that allergy also applies to other plants and foods, including the cannabis plant. Um, for uh, parents who might be consuming um, smokeless in a smokeless way, for example, using vaporizer cartridges, um, the exposure to kids, you know, if the, if the cannabinoids are in the air and then settle down on the surfaces in a home, you know, there is some potential exposure for them to go through the skin or for, for those molecules to be breathed through the lungs, but it's an extremely low level of exposure. Um, so there's a lot of work left to do here. Um, and, we're, you know, the, the, the jury really is still out in terms of what is the genuine risk to, um, to children after secondhand exposure. Um, we don't really know yet. So that's some of the risks of cannabis, but you know, if we think about what are the reasons that patients might be using cannabis to begin with, um, what I've done here on the left is I've listed out several um, forms of cannabinoid medication. Some of these are FDA approved. Those are the ones that are in blue. Um, and the ones that are in black are just the botanical cannabis and products made from the botanical cannabis. Um, and everything that you see on the right are all of the indications or the diseases or the, the, um, the symptoms that people are using to treat um, uh, using cannabis. So um, the most common things that we see sort of like in an epidemiological level, most people who use cannabis are using it for chronic pain. Um, and then along with chronic pain also often comes, you know, mood disorders and sleep disorder. Um, you know, there's lots of research going on about the potential medical benefits of cannabis. The field, you know, has really skyrocketed um, over the last five to 10 years in particular. Um, but the other really important thing that um, people use cannabis for is for uh, as a substitute for other medications that are either more harmful, more dangerous, or have um, more intense side effects. So most notably, you know, cannabis, you know, when it's being used for pain, the way that it works is that it gets into the bloodstream, it goes up and it activates the brain's descending pain pathway. So it shuts off pain at the level of the brain, which then prevents the pain signals from even coming into the spinal cord from the body. What's really interesting about this mechanism, and this is what I've studied since I was a grad student, um, what's really interesting is that this is the exact same way that opioids work. Opioids get into the brain, they activate this descending pain pathway that shuts off pain signals from coming into the spinal cord in the exact same way that cannabis works. What's interesting though, is that if we look at what happens at, um, in a state after they legalize medical cannabis, there's a few notable things. So number one, Medicare prescription drug costs go down, especially for medications that relieve pain, help sleep, and improve mood, like benzodiazepines. Um, 
The other thing that happens is um, the um, employee productivity goes up, and this is measured by the number of sick days. So after a state legalizes cannabis, people call in sick to work less often. Um, but the thing that you know has really been lighting a fire under my career and keeping me up in the middle of the night for the last 20 years is the fact that when a state legalizes cannabis, there is a major reduction in opioid overdoses. So that's a 23% drop in emergency room visits and a 25% drop on average in fatal opioid overdoses. And the longer a medical cannabis law has been in effect, the greater this effect is. So for example, California um, has had uh, legal cannabis since 1996. So these effects are even bigger in California than they are in states where cannabis you know, laws are brand new. So this really goes against all the things that I grew up learning about cannabis, which was that, you know, um, it was the gateway drug to using more harmful drugs, right? That using cannabis somehow primed a person to be more vulnerable to using other more dangerous drugs. But, you know, over the course of my career, the addiction field has really evolved and we've taking a very careful look at all this data. And what we see is that there is a correlation between people who use substances like cannabis and substances like, you know, heroin. Um, however, that's a correlation. It's not the cause. It's not the reason that people are using heroin. And then that correlation is also true for substances like nicotine and alcohol. So if someone smokes uh, cigarettes, they're more likely to use other more dangerous drugs. If someone drinks alcohol, they're more likely to use more dangerous drugs. So what we see now, how we understand addiction, is that this is risk-taking behavior. And certain people are more vulnerable to taking risks. Um, so it's not necessarily that cannabis is the gateway drug to using more harmful drugs like opioids. And in fact, it could be a strategy to reduce the harms of opioids. Um, and so, you know, I, I wanted to pause for just a moment and, and talk about some of the other things that we see um, with cannabis, which is that, you know, obviously with our chronic pain patients, what we've seen in our clinical studies is that um, you know we we have to do relatively little. We just give them access to cannabis, and then six months later, they you know thirty percent of our patients have stopped using opioids entirely. Another thirty percent of our patients have significantly reduced their doses. So you know this this phenomenon of when a person gets access to cannabis, they stop using their opioids or significantly reduce their opioid use. What we'd be really curious about is if that was specific just to people who are in chronic pain. But as it turns out, that sort of protective effect of, of cannabis also applies to people who are using um, illicit opioids. So what we've seen in Canada, for example, is that you know folks who are using illicit opioids like heroin and fentanyl, they're four times less likely to end up in the emergency department with an overdose if they are also a cannabis user. And we see that for people who are on medication, um, you know, um, uh, opioid um, replacement therapy, uh, such as methadone or suboxone. If those folks are also cannabis users, two things happen. Number one, they can reduce their doses of opioids. So they need less Suboxone if they're a cannabis user. That's exactly like what we see in our chronic pain patients. So no matter what opioid you're using, if you're also using cannabis, you can reduce the doses of your opioids, which is always a good thing. Um, the other thing that happens is uh, two other things. People report that they're able to sort of fend off the withdrawal symptoms if the dose of, of buprenorphine or suboxone or, or methadone is just a little bit too low and there's you know some really low level withdrawal symptoms, people find that they're able to cope with those withdrawal symptoms if they use cannabis instead. So it sort of you know, there's this boost of the effects, the beneficial effects of the opioids um, when people are using cannabis at the same time. Um, the other thing that we've seen is that um, for people who are in opioid treatment, that often cannabis can be used um, to adhere to that treatment program. So people who are cannabis users are more likely 
to stay in treatment. So there's tons of amazing work going on there. And that's, that's a topic that I usually spend a full, you know, 60 to 90 minutes just talking about that stuff. So it's a very rich literature, very, very profoundly, you know, clinically useful effects. Um, and it, and it is probably, at least in my opinion, and I'm biased because this is my field, you know, the fact that cannabis can be used to, um, you know, help people who are suffering from chronic pain and help people who are struggling with opioid dependence, who are often the same people, right? Because we know that about 85% of people who are on medication assisted therapy, um, for, for opioid withdrawal, 80% of those people are in pain. And so when you have someone who's in pain, and they are unable to treat their pain with a prescription opioid, they need some other tool because pain is a trigger for relapse. So being able to you know, provide treatment um, that, that you know, is a, a harm reduction approach um, is, is really beneficial for these folks. Um, so I wanna switch gears a little bit more and talk about um, specifically you know, some other kinds of effects, you know, other than opioid sparing or reducing the doses of opioids, other than relieving pain, you know, what else does cannabis do? It's very obvious that <laughs> cannabis causes psychomotor impairment, right? People can't think as clearly or use their bodies as well after they have had a certain exposure to cannabis. So that's particularly important in the context of driving. It's definitely true. You should not, you know, use cannabis and drive. Um, the other thing that we see in patients, though, you know, in addition to the, the pain relief um, and improvements in mood and sleep is just in general an improvement in quality of life. And that's really important because, you know, the pain relieving effects of cannabis, you know, they're relatively modest, especially compared to opioids. Opioids really hammer pain over the head. There's nothing more profound than an opioid when it comes to pain relief. Um, and cannabis is a lot more subtle. Um, but unlike opioids, patients who use cannabis report that it is improving the quality of their life. They're able to cope with their pain, live with their pain. Um, not necessarily that it's eliminating the pain the way that opioids do. So, you know, this, this opioid sparing effect where patients are able to reduce their doses of opioids, it's also true for other kinds of medications such as benzodiazepines, which can, can also be uh, deadly, um, and antidepressants. Um, what's really interesting, though, is that we also see in, in um, you know, medical patients, when they start using cannabis as a regular part of their healthcare routine, they actually show improved brain function, not reduced brain function. So they're able to think more clearly after they've been using cannabis for three months as compared to the time that they, they weren't using cannabis. Now, do we think that cannabis is improving cognition, improving their ability to think? Probably not. <laughs> Probably what's happening is that opioids and benzodiazepines and antidepressants cause cognitive impairment, which we don't often talk about. And when people switch those medications and they're no longer taking those benzodiazepines and opioids, then they're able to, to function a little better. Now, when it comes to adolescence, the picture is very, very, very different, you know, and I'll just, you know, I'll get right out ahead of this and just say, adolescents and teenagers should not use cannabis. There is tons of evidence to support the idea that the, the developing brain should not be exposed to THC in particular. CBD is a lot different. Um, what is also true is that the earlier a person starts using cannabis, the worse these outcomes are. So what are these outcomes we're talking about? Number one, kids are more prone to develop a substance use disorder if they start using cannabis before age 18. They're also more likely to have trouble in school. So academic achievement and college degrees are less likely to happen in kids who are using cannabis as adolescents. Um, there are mental health risks as well. So people um, who start using cannabis young are more likely to, to develop depression, anxiety in adulthood and experience psychotic-like symptoms. Um, and of course, there is a huge risk of poisoning. And when I say poisoning, this is a, a high dose of THC, which causes 
no good effects at all and only bad effects. Um, and, and really what that looked like is, is truly, you know, cannabis induced psychosis. So it's a, a short period of time when there are, you know, uh, delusions, um, the sensation that I'm not myself, feeling like you're going to die, extreme paranoia and anxiety. Um, and it is a, a temporary, um, a temporary syndrome. It does go away with time, um, but it's extremely distressing. Um, and it is often linked to the strongest cannabis products. So when I'm saying concentrate use, cannabis concentrates are, are not the raw plant itself, but rather where um, a manufacturer has sucked all the THC out of the plant and put it in this extremely potent form, you know, uh, upwards of 80% THC. It's a, a crystalline or a waxy structure. Um, and then that's inhaled and it is like an an immediate overdose in inside the brain. And that's, that's an extremely risky product, which, you know, I would not advise anyone using, you know, unless, you know, you're a, 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 an extremely experienced cannabis user with high, high, high medical needs. It's, it's an extremely risky product. Um, so the, the counterpoint to that is that, you know, for some medical patients who happen to be children, there have been undeniably lots of stories out there in the world of kids who have benefited from using cannabis. Um, and when I say cannabis, I'm talking about, you know, cannabis that is composed mostly of CBD. Usually it's very low doses of THC, but it's not always no THC at all. So there is an FDA approved drug um, called Epidiolex and Epidiolex is, you know, botanically derived cannabidiol or CBD that is FDA approved for pediatric seizures, right? So lots of children with seizure disorder have been using CBD. Um, it's one of the main reasons that states allowed medical CBD um, laws in the first place. Um, but a lot of patients also find, you know, benefit from very, very, very low levels of THC as well. So this is just one example, Darren Blackwell, of a patient like that who benefited from low dose THC cannabis. Um, the, the thing, there's some other things to think about when it comes to development, especially um, uh, cannabis use during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, so the long of the short here is there's not enough evidence to say exactly what's going on here. So during pregnancy, cannabis use during pregnancy does lead to low birth weight. And we know exactly why this is. We've done all the science and animals to figure out that there's just less blood flow to the placenta and kids are born small and they're sometimes born early. But other than that, they catch up and they develop normally as far as we can tell so far. So it really is just this small baby's born a little early. Um, Cannabis use during breastfeeding is incredibly inconclusive right now. Um, you know, it's it's hard to separate out the effects of what what was happening to the baby as a result of using cannabis during pregnancy versus what's happening to the baby as a result of using cannabis during breastfeeding. So those things are often, you know, intertwined. So it's hard to separate out exactly what's happening. Um, for a lot of medical patients, however, what we're finding is that the risks of using the risk to the child of using cannabis during breastfeeding don't necessarily outweigh the risks, uh, or sorry, don't outweigh the benefits to the patient um, during breastfeeding. So, you know, for a lot of people, cannabis is the only um, medication that effectively treats their symptoms, relie relieves their spasticity in MS, or you know, relieves their chronic pain. Um, and so um, having to switch to, uh, you know, a more um, intense medication um, that is also, you know, passed on to the kid that we also don't understand. Um, so it's, it's inconclusive right now. We don't have enough evidence to say that the risks of using cannabis during breastfeeding outweigh the benefits. The one major, 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 the most important risk to children, full stop, the entire talk, the most important thing to focus on is that the greatest risk to children when it comes to cannabis is them accidentally eating it themselves. So all of these, um, you know, in, in regulated cannabis markets, for example, here in Oregon, the types of packaging that you're seeing here are totally illegal. 
However, these types of packaging show up in lots of vape shops where cannabis is, you know, Delta 9 cannabis is illegal, um, but where other products like Delta 8, you know, those are legal in almost all 50 states, except for places where Delta 8 has been explicitly banned. Um, so there's no regulation on what a cannabis package can look like in a lot of places, which leads to a lot of accidental poisoning. So we've seen poison control centers and the CDC have been reporting a huge increase in the number of pediatric poisonings from, from kids eating a lot of THC accidentally because they are mistaking it for candy. So this is the, the number one risk to kids is um, accidentally ingesting uh, cannabis edibles. Okay, so now we're going to move into a thought experiment. We're going to think about what it means for, um, you know, parents to consume alcohol and what it means for parents to consume cannabis. So, you know, what I'd like you to do is just take a moment to think about what would happen if at the federal level, cannabis was removed from the Controlled Substances Act entirely. And what that would mean is that it would be, you know, no longer federally prohibited at all, and it would be regulated in exactly the same way that alcohol is regulated on a state by state basis. Every state sets their own age limits, their own, you know, percentage of alcohol that can be, um, you know, in a can of beer, where beer and liquor are sold. Um, so, so in, in the exact same way that, you know, cannabis or that alcohol is regulated, what, what would that look like? And more specifically, how does that impact caretaking, right? When you're in your jobs, thinking about a person who is using alcohol, you know, how do you think about using uh, a person's alcohol use when it comes to their parenting, you know, like, what, how is alcohol treated in the home and in the child welfare system? How do you know when, when alcohol is a problem? I'm asking all those questions because it's a really forward thinking way of thinking about, you know, there's lots of proposed changes to the, the ways that the federal government is regulating cannabis. I've been involved in some of those conversations around the PREPARE Act. Um, in particular. And so, you know, the, the Department of Health and Human Services has recommended descheduling to the DEA. So, you know, it's, it's very possible that at some point in the near future, cannabis could be related, uh, regulated in the exact same way alcohol is. So it's important to, to start thinking about, you know, how you recognize problematic alcohol when it comes to, you know, parenting in the child welfare system and thinking about cannabis in the exact same way. So let's talk about what responsible use by parents looks like. And, you know, you'll, you'll have to forgive my lens on this. You know, I'm speaking from Oregon where we've had medical access since 1998. We've had adult use access since 2015. So it's been a, a very long time that I've been steeped in this culture of, you know, parents using cannabis responsibly. It's a non-issue for me. And I realize that that's a very different situation from where you are and where you're coming from. So I wanted to pause a moment and talk about what does this actually look like for a parent to use cannabis responsibly? Um, obviously, the most important consideration is a patient's rights, right? If a person has a, a genuine medical need, that has been authorized by their healthcare provider, then they're able, they should have legal access to their medicine, right? This is a, just a civil rights issue. Um, so when they have legal access, then they can have their medical needs met. Um, when their medical needs are met, they can often show up to be a better parent, right? They're able to um, you know, handle difficult emotions when it comes to parenting. Parenting is hard. Um, you know, there and people who use cannabis are also more likely to discuss cannabis use with their children, which is very different than the way that a lot of us on this call were probably raised. And it's also different, is certainly different than the way that I was raised. You know, my parents never talked to me about cannabis. You know, I had to go out there into the world and figure it out for myself. And the information that I was getting from school wasn't evidence-based information. 
Um, you know, the other thing with cannabis, like we talked about earlier, is that there is there are dose dependent effects, and it's very possible for people to achieve medical benefits without experiencing impairment. One of the slides that I love to show from our results of our, you know, um, chronic pain patients, these are orthopedic pain patients, um, is that most people, the majority of people experience medical benefit in the absence of impairment. That's really, really important. And so it is absolutely possible to learn how to use cannabis responsibly. Um, a couple more notes um, comparing cannabis and alcohol. So obviously both of these substances cause impairment. The difference between cannabis impairment and alcohol impairment is that if, if you put people in a driving simulator and they've had alcohol, they're not aware of how impaired they are or how many driving mistakes they are. And with people who have consumed cannabis, they actually have an increased awareness of how impaired they are. They know exactly how many mistakes they've made. They're aware of their impairment. Um, and so that awareness of impairment could you know, potentially um, explain why some people choose not to drive after they have consumed cannabis because they realize that they're incapable of driving. Um, Alcohol, there's a huge link to domestic violence, whereas that link has not been demonstrated with people who use cannabis. Um, there's a huge economic and health, public health burden of, of alcohol in this country. Um, you know, a, a huge amount of, you know, uh, mortality, pe the lifespan of people who use alcohol is, is shorter than people who don't use alcohol. Um, and, and those kind of economic impacts have not been seen with cannabis. In fact, people show up to work more um, and there are genuine medical benefits of cannabis rather than a shortened lifespan. Um, and importantly, this is not something that is often talked about, but the relative abuse potential of these two substances is, you know, it's different. Cannabis is less addictive than alcohol is. That said, Cannabis is a rewarding substance. It makes people feel good. It, it um, teaches the brain that this feels good and you should do it again. That's reward. However, um, you know, it can be used in, in an imbalanced way, in, a, in an unsustainable way. And so um, when people start to misuse cannabis and, be, and become physically dependent upon it, um, those are some things that um, we think about when, when we're um, diagnosing cannabis use disorder. The, the primary hallmark of any substance use disorder is continuing to use it despite negative consequences. And those negative consequences could be health, uh, work, relationships, so continuing to eat m monetary, you're spending a lot of money on cannabis. So continued use, despite the presence of negative consequences, that's really the big hallmark of cannabis use disorder. Um, including, you know, there's some other things, you know, for, for a person to actually be, be diagnosed with this disorder by a mental health professional, they have to have multiple symptoms, including using larger amounts or over a longer period, um, trying to quit and not being able to quit. Um, they spend a lot of time um, acquiring cannabis, using it, or recovering from its effects. Most importantly, people crave cannabis. Um, this is, you know, similar to other substances. Um, it becomes more of a priority than work or school or hygiene or responsibilities to others. Um, and, you know, obviously using it in contexts where it's dangerous, like driving, that's another hallmark. Um, and uh, tolerance and withdrawal are also, you know, tied up in there. So using so much cannabis that the brain gets used to it and need more to achieve the desired effect. And then when you stop using cannabis, there, there are genuine cannabis withdrawal symptoms. So this is the point where we're going to, you know, take a brief break and we'll come back, I think, in 10 minutes and then we'll continue. We were going to try. We were going to just maybe see if we could just do a couple questions here before we go. Yeah. On. Sure. And there were, as you can imagine, some questions about um, adolescents, children, nursing moms and that stuff, even before you got to that slide, because mm -hmm. so many of the people on the call um, are working with these kinds of parents on a regular basis. So um, there was quite a bit of interest there. Um, you want me to do this, Mike, or you want to pop on? I think it would be good to do um, Techni Fabian's question. And then we had another one on children here, um, or I can do it. 
Anyway. All right. He says me. Uh, we So we had a person on here that said that I have a mother that has a medical marijuana card and has been breastfeeding her baby while using. I addressed mm -hmm. the issue with her and she no longer breastfeeds. Um, she continues to smoke. The mother was upset with me and stated that she has breastfed her oldest child, who's three, while using marijuana, and the child has no issues. Um, she's also an herbalist. Um, and uh, so the question is ultimately, has there been any studies showing that it's harmful for mothers to breastfeed while smoking marijuana? So we're going to talk specifically more about breastfeeding in a little bit. So I might pause on that one and come back to it because we're we're going to delve into that specifically because, um, yeah, we'll we'll come back to that. And then this one goes with it. What kind of research is, how is the research being collected on cannabis use while pregnant? So you, you can put mm -hmm. that one together with that guy. Um, yeah. Someone else wanted to know, uh, are there cases of people overdosing on cannabis? In other words... I think they mean to death mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because you can take too much of something and you've already explained that to us. You can take too much of this stuff. So that would be an overdose. But I'm thinking this question is more about dying from taking too much. I think you're right. And um, I think the answer is yes, but in extremely rare occasions and usually there are two things that are required. Number one, the person has to have a pre-existing cardiac condition. So the way that people die is, you know, having um, heart problems, you know, uh, it's, it's very similar to a heart attack. Um, so if you are already a cardiac patient, you're vulnerable to the cardiac effects of cannabis. It does affect our heart rate and our blood pressure. So the only other times where people have had a lethal experience after consuming cannabis is when they're, they're consuming cannabis concentrates. So that is extremely potent cannabis that is rapidly inhaled. And that right. is what causes a rapid change in heart and um, um, blood pressure. And in fact, there's just one, one case report in the literature of a young woman, a uh, 17 year old girl having a seizure after, after engaging with this activity. So for cannabis concentrates, yes, I think that those could be potentially lethal drugs in extremely rare circumstances. For other forms of cannabis, no, they're not lethal. It gets a little complicated because you could say, okay, if a person is driving a car and they have an accident and they die and they were under the use of cannabis, is that an overdose? It, it, is, it is a death that could be related to cannabis. Same thing for geriatric patients, right? If they um, are using cannabis at home, they have a slip and fall, that slip and fall leads to a, a hospital infection, and then they end up, you know, declining and dying. And it all started because they were using cannabis at home. Yeah, maybe I mean, I, you might categorize that too, but that's, that's a lot different than inhaling cannabis and having a heart attack. Yeah, I hear you saying in extremely rare cases, in fact, so such a small percentage as you compare it across to other substances that is negligible. Exactly, precisely. Yeah, if we look at how many people die from alcohol withdrawal alone, alcohol use disorder, um, you know, um, cirrhosis of the liver because of alcohol, you know, it's, you know, thousands of people every year, it's 30 or 40,000 people every year. So, you know, compared to other substances, yeah, the risk is exceedingly rare. Um, I might save some of these for later. Let's see. We just had a few more come in. Is there any way to tell when a parent appears impaired due to alcohol or cannabis with out doing testing. That's an interesting question. Um, you mentioned improved work productivity for cannabis users. Is there any research on the lack of ability or motivation to acquire a job by cannabis users? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I, in fact, there has been some really elegant work that demonstrates that, that um, the lack of motivation um, has been, at least in two clinical studies that I've seen, um, does not exist. So um, that, that, that kind of, um, prototypical, you know, couched lock stoner stereotype, um, has not been borne out by, by the clinical studies. 
Excellent. This is a really nice one. Do rehab facilities allow recovering patients to use cannabis mm. while detoxing from other drugs? Some do. Yes. And this started probably close to 10 years ago. It's kind of called the high sobriety movement. Um, and in fact, there were certain treatment centers that, you know, primarily relied on cannabis as their, their primary tool for dealing with, you know, withdrawal symptoms and, and coping. Um, I don't know that it should necessarily be the, the primary tool in addressing substance use, but certainly all the stuff that we're seeing from opioid use disorder, being able to, you know, cope with withdrawal symptoms, you know, um, Again, this, that's normally something that I give a, a full hour talk on. So there's a very rich literature that, that supports the use of cannabis as a tool during um, substance use treatment, not the only tool. All substance use treatment is best when it's a, 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 a web of approaches and support, not just one thing alone. Um, and it's certainly not for everyone, particularly for people who have had a history of misusing cannabis. It's, not, it's probably not the best tool for that person. Mm -hmm. um do you think the the information you're providing today would be good information to provide as a guide to parents um who are maybe system involved mm -hmm. yeah this is something that i've been working with the oregon health authority really closely on so we're trying to distill all the literature and make audience specific guidance so here's what healthcare providers need to know here's what patients and, and consumers need to know Here's what high school guidance counselors and, and parents need to know. So that's something I'm really, really interested in. And then at the end, I'll, I'll show some um, some resources from Canada that are really helpful as well. So so yeah, we can we can readdress that later. Okay, I'm going to save a couple others that are around pregnancy and um, early childhood parenting. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one's about it being laced with fentanyl. I mean, I know what you're going to say about that. You know, you're <laughs> laced with what fentanyl. I mean, what I think you're going to say about that is these are the reasons to regulate, to keep things safe and, and, and be, know what you're taking and, and how, and why I think, mm -hmm. that's what am I right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> in Oregon, there's never once been fentanyl in any regulated cannabis product ever, never once, right? right? And the only reason that you would be exposed to fentanyl through you know, using a cannabis product is if you're buying it from an unregulated source that has not been independently tested by a third party. Um, so yeah, that's that's the primary benefit of a legalized cannabis uh, environment is that consumer safety is the point, right? We want to know what is in there. We want to be assured that there are no contaminants and we want to know exactly how much of the active ingredient is there. That is the primary purpose of legalization. There's several questions here about um, uh, bipolar disorder and psychosis and, and um, you know, having these paranoid effects. I think you already spoke to that and said, um, these are rare and temporary. Is that correct? Yeah, there's, you know, in general, you know, all, there's a whole field of research that is this mysterious relationship between what we used to call schizophrenia or psychotic, you know, disorder or psychotic like symptoms and cannabis. So, you know, the jury is still out. We know that, you know, if you take a whole lot of THC at one time, it can induce psychotic like symptoms. Um, if you are a person who was already genetically predisposed to psychotic disorder, cannabis can trigger that the symptoms of that disorder earlier than they would have developed on their own. But in terms of, you know, does using cannabis as a teenager cause a person to develop psychotic, you know, disorder? Probably not. Um, you know, there's, it, it's a very complex situation um, that is, has been difficult to untangle, especially because, you know, schizophrenia is almost impossible to, to model in rodents. You know, it's in, impossible to study it in the lab for the most part. Um, so what we do know is that young people shouldn't use cannabis until their brain is done growing, age 21, 22. Um, and probably most people should avoid concentrates full stop. Yeah. And the wax and all that stuff. Yeah. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Dabs, shatter, butter, you know, there's lots of, you know, colloquial names for it. It's all hyper-concentrated THC. Yeah. Very good. Um, there's more questions here that we'll, we'll get to a little later. Um, some of it's about what specifically types of cannabis should be for this or that, you know, and I know that's a pretty complicated space, but I think mm -hmm. you're going to speak to that a little bit more. So with that, let's take a little uh, 10 minute break and come back at quarter after or no, sounds good. 20 after. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. While people are coming back on, I'm just kind of scrolling through some of the questions, AD. And uh, I think in, for the most part, you've answered many of these. A lot of people are asking the same question in different ways. And it, it occurs to me that it's sort of hard to wrap your brain around making this shift. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because it's like, this has been categorized. I mean, I think you did a good job. It, you you did everything really fast. Of course, it's a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. really An entire so field of ah! research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, we've had this categorization of drugs and the danger of drugs. And I mean, I just uh, spoke with my mother uh, yesterday and she was telling me about her, her friend that she went over and I asked how her kids were doing. And she says, well, you know, they're on drugs. And I said, oh, which drugs? Mm -hmm. And my mom didn't know. Um, and she said, well, why do you ask me that? And I said, well, because there's such a broad, when we say drugs, there's such a broad spectrum of what that means mm -hmm. and what that means for recovery. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what that means for misuse, what that means for the implication, health implications and what that means for recovery. So she said, well, I'll have to ask her. And so she, you know, I kind of <laughs> piqued her interest a little bit in just kind of saying, all drugs are not created equally. And I feel mm -hmm. like maybe people are struggling a little bit about this idea that have we miscategorized um, cannabis and have we, yeah. and, and have we um, made it into something that it's not intended to be? So I don't know mm -hmm. what you want to do with that as we have one more minute before we've promised to get back onto the PowerPoint. <laughs> so if you wanted to yeah. just do that briefly. Of course, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that grew up with those beliefs. You know, I was taught in school, just say no, right. And say no to everything because everything is going to ruin your life equally. And if we look at the evidence, which is always the only place I turn to for, for sanity, <laughs> if we look at the evidence, they're not all created equal. They're not all as addictive. They they do not all have the same severity of withdrawal symptoms and impact on our lives. Um, they don't have the same risks in terms of like acute overdose. So it really is not fair at all to put them all into one bucket as drugs. Um, it is a continuum of risk. All drugs do have some risk. There's no such thing as a risk-free endeavor, including getting in the car and coming to the lab this morning when it was pouring rain, right? That's risky. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think that what, what I am really hopeful for for my kiddo is that she's now being raised in an environment of transparency and genuine scientifically informed education rather than a fear-based abstinence only system. Um, and so we're gonna dive right into where that fear-based abstinence system came from. So if we're ready to get started, I'd, I'm happy to do that. Sounds good, let's do it. Okay. So, you know, this fear-based system was purposeful. It was orchestrated by the leaders of our country beginning in the 30s and continuing through the 60s with Henry Anslinger on the left, Richard Nixon on the right. Um, Henry Anslinger in particular, um, you know, there's a public record of him testifying in Congress making extremely racist statements against um, Blacks and Mexicans. Um, so before Henry Anslinger took office, cannabis in America was referred to as cannabis, and he introduced the word marijuana into the law and the lexicon on purpose to take, to, to make this substance a foreign, terrifying 
problem associating it with people of color. Richard Nixon picked up that effort and carried it through intentionally because, you know, as as his um, attorney is on the record talking about, they couldn't make it illegal to be Mexican or Black. They also couldn't make it illegal to oppose the Vietnam War. But if they associated drugs with those communities, then they could put those people in jail for using drugs. And most of the time when we're saying drugs, we're talking about cannabis. So the war on drugs really is a war on cannabis. And that there's only one statistic that you need to look at um, in order to, to see that very clearly, which is that you know 82% of arrests, drug arrests, are arrests for cannabis, right? That's the vast majority of drug-related offenses are cannabis offenses. Um, 60% of women who are in federal prison committed nonviolent drug offenses. And this is still continuing to this day. Even in 2020, someone was arrested for cannabis possession every 90 seconds in the U.S. Um, another important thing to keep in mind is that 60% of women in state and federal prisons are the mothers of minor children. So this fear-based, racist, intentionally racist policy of making American citizens afraid of drugs, demonizing them, associating them with people of color is directly impacting women who are mothers of minor children. Um, it's also extremely important to recognize the disproportionate impact that the war of drugs has had on people of color. So black people are 3.6 times more likely to be arrested for, for drug possession and other drug crimes. Um, despite completely similar rates of cannabis use across the entire country. So I saw one of the one of the questions in the chat was, you know, uh, what is the rate or the prevalence of cannabis use in black youth in the South? It's the exact same as white youth, white youth in the South. What is it in the, um, the Northwest or the Northeast? It's the exact same as the white use in the Northeast. So despite you know, coast to coast, similar rates of use of cannabis, black people are 3.6 times more likely to be arrested. So let's have a look at, you know, zoom in a little bit more closely on what's happening in Florida. Um, so, you know, of the, the referrals that are made for child mal maltreatment that, that met the criteria needed for investigation, 65% um, of those referrals are children who are non-white. And there's some sort of breakdown there of you know, the exact numbers. 45% um, of children um, live in a parent with, uh, in a household with a parent who does not have a college degree. So, you know, in Florida, what we're looking at is, you know, the, the child welfare system is really um, um, a system that is involving children who come from um, uneducated non-white households for the most part. And importantly, you know, 312,000 312, children in Florida were separated from a parent due to incarceration. So if we back up to this slide and we think about, well, what are, what are, what's the overall composition of the carceral system in America? You know, you can bet that, you know, roughly 82% of those arrests that led to incarceration of these children in Florida, those were probably linked to cannabis. So, you know, I am by no means an expert in the federal legislation that protects, you know, um, infants um, and, and families and children when it comes to, um, you know, just general child, you know, federal child welfare laws. Um, but, you know, in my, you know, own due diligence of, you know, trying to understand how these systems interact, you know, I do understand that, you know, federal, you know, legislation does attempt to protect infants who are, quote, born affected by illegal substances. You know, it would it would be really nice if we had a very clear definition of what born affected means. But unfortunately, you know, that term has been, you know, pretty nebulous. We, we don't have a, a consensus definition of what affected really means. Um, so, you know, the Brookings Institute has published some data showing that substance misuse um, is responsible for 80% of the abuse and neglect cases um, that, are, that are out there in, in total. Um, 
And, you know, a large part of those abuse and neglect cases come from perinatal blood screening. So when a pregnant mother is coming into the hospital for labor and delivery, um, you know, blood draws happen all throughout pregnancy, including, you know, sometimes when, when labor and delivery is happening. And often what happens is, and, and this, is, this is often required under CAPTA, is that the, the positive um, blood results, if there's THC in the blood, that is a trigger for the involvement of Child Protective Services. And that means that the, the Child Protective Services system carries this huge caseload of people who have, trigger, or who have uh, screened positive for THC in the hospital. And this puts often the healthcare providers in a weird, conflicted situation because, you know, they are, their priority is not to enforce the law and, and you know, uh, get involved with child protective services. The obstetrician's obligation and the healthcare provider's obligations are to provide care for the mother, regardless of the legal situation that's happening. So it's a really sticky situation. It's not easy to navigate. You know, these hospital policies that are, you know, federally mandated, um, you know, re this reporting is, it, it's a real issue. It's really happening. Um, the problem is that a lot of people who are testing positive in a blood screen um, can be using cannabis legally and or responsibly. So not all people who use cannabis qualify for cannabis use disorder. Not all people who use cannabis use cannabis in risky situations, such as when they're driving or when they're caretaking. Um, so it's very possible that a lot of people who, you know, test positive for cannabis in their blood have been using cannabis as recommended by their healthcare provider. Um, it's really important to note that unlike opioid withdrawal syndrome in, in, in infants, you know, who are born to mothers who have been using opioids during pregnancy, that sort of newborn withdrawal symptom does not happen with cannabis. So no matter how heavily a person was using cannabis during their pregnancy, there is no withdrawal syndrome in the infant. Uh, likewise, you know, if we watch what happens to kids who are born to parents who use cannabis during pregnancy, what happens to them over their lifetime? It's impossible to, to pull out cannabis use from any of the other factors that could affect child development. So the people who do better you know, in terms of, you know, the kids who grow up to be, you know, the healthiest, happiest, most functional, you know, those are generally kids who come from white parents, educated parents, parents from high socioeconomic status, you know, all of those things predict child welfare um, very clearly. And cannabis use does not predict long term child welfare at all. Um, so there's, there's not really any evidence, um, you know, that, that cannabis causes withdrawal right there in the newborn situation. And, you know, we, we can't tease cannabis use out from all the other, you know, societal factors that might cause a kid not to do well in school five or 10 or 15 years later. Um, there's also, you know, not any evidence to say that using cannabis during pregnancy for things like nausea, right? Morning sickness. Um, nausea is an extremely common problem in pregnancy. Um, and the evidence doesn't suggest that that's child abuse, right? If we're thinking about what is the medical need of the mother and how does that medical need balance in terms of reducing overall harms and, and enhancing the well being of the mother so that she can get to the date of delivery. That's a complex situation, and it's one that should be decided between a patient and their healthcare provider. That's that's really it's a, a personalized medicine approach. Um, the 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 big um, kind of take home message here that a lot of healthcare systems are um, enacting, you know, my health my hospital system included. Um, is that they simply stop screening for cannabinoids, ironically, because it's just costing too much money, <laughs> right? We're, we're, we stop screening for cannabinoids because we're, we're just wasting money on it. Um, we stopped looking for THC because it wasn't having an impact on either our hiring practices, um, our patient well-being. It wasn't um, interfering with uh, organ transplant or any of the other things that we measure at the hospital system, you know, for, for our uh, quality of care. It was just costing us too much money, so we stopped doing it. Um, so, you know, this, now we're going to shift into, you know, 
how these, especially um, drug screening policies could be more harmful or, or even these, you know, federal um, policies around, you know, protecting infants might actually be doing more harm than cannabis itself. So, you know, here's a, another article that's related to the hospital practices I was just talking about how, you know, there's not really um, any usefulness of drug testing in the hospital around the time of birth and delivery. Um, and this relates to, you know, there's a this um, really elegant paper published last year um, about it's, it's an ethical debate over, you know, a patient who is caught breastfeeding um, and instructed to stop on the basis of their um, on their can their cannabis use. So, um, you know, drug screening effectively tells you if a person used cannabis in the last 30 days. Drug screening does not tell you if a person is actively impaired right there in that moment. Um, drug screening also doesn't tell you if the person um, qualifies as being diagnosed with cannabis use disorder. And drug screening can't even really tell you how sensitive or insensitive a person is to THC or the effects of cannabis. There's a huge individual variability and when a person consumes cannabis, what it looks like inside their body, either their oral fluid, their urine or their blood. Um, and, and so despite the fact that, you know, um, biomarkers, especially blood levels of THC, they only really tell us if a person has used cannabis in the last 30 days. And despite the fact that that's the only thing that, you know, it tells us it's still being used um, as a primary tool to begin welfare investigations. And law enforcement um, um, involvement as well, of course. Mm -hmm. Somebody was somebody was asking, I don't know if this is the best time, but is the FDA, because you were talking about the federal government a little bit, is the FDA doing studies on cannabis now, currently? The unfortunate problem is that Cannabis remains a federal Schedule I substance, which means that federal research money, usually coming from the National Institutes of Health, not the FDA, um, research money can't be dedicated to doing studies like that um, because it's federally illegal. It's extremely difficult to conduct controlled research studies with cannabis. Um, so... It, it, it's kind of a catch-22 because, you know, the FDA is saying, all right, if you want us to regulate cannabis, then we need more evidence and we can't generate more evidence because it's illegal. So it's this catch-22, need more evidence to make it legal, don't have enough evidence to make it legal, can't get the evidence because it's illegal, right? So it, it's, a, it's a really frustrating situation as a person who's been trying to conduct research in this environment for the last 20 years, um, which is why some of the ways that we collect this evidence, we have to get very creative. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, so, so, you know, one of the earlier questions was, okay, like I, I'm working with a parent, they're using cannabis and I'm instructing them to stop breastfeeding. So that relates directly to this paper. You know, it's the exact same situation that was, that sparked this ethical debate, you know, in this paper in 2022. And what the conclusion there was, was that there are so many well-documented benefits of breastfeeding that the undocumented potential risks of cannabis exposure exposure do not outweigh those benefits. So the benefits of breastfeeding should absolutely take the priority. Um, any potential fear or potential risks that exist from uh, a, a child being exposed to cannabinoids in the breast milk, those have not, th there's not enough evidence to say that, you know, um, the, the risks outweigh the harms or the benefits. So um, that, that was the conclusion of the paper is that, you know, regardless of the situation, a parent should be receiving lactation con uh, consulting and they should be allowed to breastfeed. And that, you know, essentially withholding that health care and providing that ill-advised medical advice um, essentially um, uh, classifies as discrimination. You're, discrimi you're giving someone different advice based on their behavior. Um, so, the the and and what that really um what that boils down to is just this very common misconception that 
any cannabis use or all cannabis use is a problem. And, and it's really not that black and white. It, it truly is not. Um, so I know we're like getting close to time here. Um, I, I believe how much time do we have left? We're going for another, um, 25 minutes or so. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, oh, that's right. I forgot that I, I joined the call earlier than, than our start time. Um, so, so some of the things that people in the system may be concerned about is like, you know, um, our, I have a huge caseload. A lot of this caseload comes from a person who tested for positive and for THC in the hospital, you know, so what exactly going on is going on here? You know, how, how, how can we start to fix this? So, you know, it's very, if we look at the evidence for specifically for drug testing in particular, you know, it's, it's not always the case that a person who tests positive for THC, that there, there is a child welfare issue there. Those people could be using cannabis responsibly and legally. And so we have, in that case, we have these un, unwarranted welfare investigations. They were, you know, they popped up when they don't need to be popping up. Um, and then, you know, that leads to law enforcement, abuse and neglect allegations, you know, potential loss of custody. And then when all of those things start triggering, then you have children who are impacted from that separation from their parents, right? So then we have, you know, this uh, parental separation, which is exacerbating health and wealth disparities. That's been well documented in the literature. And then you also have this, like, um, separation from parents and the, the health and wealth disparities. And those, those factors are also associated with increased use of cannabis by children who are in the welfare system. And so now you've got an intergenerational cycle where this, um, you know, drug testing policy led to a loss of custody, which leads to health and wealth disparities, and then cannabis use in the children. And so, you know, these intergenerational cycles are not necessarily triggered by the cannabis use, they're triggered by the policy. Um, and so Alison Korn um, has written extensively on this. She's a really um, fabulous policy and law uh, professor. Um, and, you know, she's quoted as saying, child protective services response to drug using parents remains disproportionately punitive or, or punishing, while the criminal justice system's policies on drug offenders are softening. So we have, you know, as our science and our research are accelerating, we have all this new understanding of what cannabis actually is and how it works. Um, and some policies are catching up to the evidence more quickly than other policies are. And that's a little so, shocking because I will say that the criminal justice system moves pretty slow mm -hmm. and they often um, aren't quite up on the research, but I know I was at uh, DOC Washington. We took the cannabis off the panel and we reduced our um, our um, new offenses quite, quite significantly, violations of probation. Um, and we saved a lot of money and we were able to focus our interventions on those that really needed it the most. So um, it was a very, it was a win-win for everyone there. And I um, mm -hmm. worked at that time. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, as some states have been legalizing cannabis, you know, there has been an outcry from their, their citizens saying, okay, well, you've made it legal now, but what about all those people who are now in jail because they were arrested a year or two years ago, right? So it's not really fair to allow some people to make money on this new commerce while other people are still sitting in jail for doing the exact same things as the capitalists are now doing. Um, and so, you know, that, that has created some tensions. And, and as a result, there have been some, you know, um, uh, efforts to have some social justice there where, you know, certain uh, precincts or states will have expungement days, right? They'll, they'll set up a, a, a weekend where um, folks can come in with their drug charges and they'll get, um, you know, expungement, you know, now that cannabis is legal in that state. So, you know, there, there are some patchwork of, you know, um, social justice reforms happening, but they're all happening on their own time and at their own pace. And it often, you know, relies on um, the really committed efforts of a handful of very passionate social justice advocates.
Um, so, you know, in, in summary, I just wanted to say that, you know, like the, the way, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate that the way that I find comfort when it comes to cannabis is simply by looking at the evidence. You know, if you take away whether any, any kind of um, moral position around this, right, like this is good or it's bad, I, I step away from all of that. And it just is. Cannabis use is. Um, and it is absolutely the case that using cannabis is not at all the same as misusing cannabis, you know, um, and I'll, I'll get to some uh, evidence from Canada here in a moment, um, but that's a particularly clear uh, signal that uh, responsible legal cannabis use is possible and probably inevitable in the U.S. Um, cannabis use during pregnancy is not always a sign of neglect or abuse, especially when they're using a legal product like Delta 8 THC, um, or when they have been legally authorized to use botanical cannabis for their, from their healthcare provider. Um, diagnosing a substance use disorder, like cannabis use disorder, does require uh, a specialized qualification. So I think I, we had a, a question early on from an audience member, how do you recognize when a person is misusing cannabis or when they're misusing alcohol? Um, you know, that does require a specialized qualification. There, there are, you know, um, specialist mental health providers who that's, that's their expertise. Um, you know, and again, to reiterate, you know, child welfare policies do not always reflect the current research, um, just like our, our other social justice policies, right? Our incarceration and our arrest policies and, you know, uh, workplace drug testing requirements, you know, those are, those are not keeping pace with research. There's, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and again, Alison Korn, Detoxing the Child Welfare System, you know, it was written almost a decade ago, but it is riveting. She's just such a, a, a well-rounded scholar in this, this regard. Um, so I'm going to read you a quote from Mark Hardin, who's the former director of child welfare at the American Bar Association Center on Children in the Law. And he says, many people in our society suffer from alcohol or drug dependence, yet they remain fit to care for a child. An alcoholic or a drug-dependent parent becomes unfit only if the dependency results in mistreatment of the child or in a failure to provide the ordinary care required for all children. I think that sums it up really nicely. That is an evidence-based statement that simply because um, a problem, a, a parent has been using a substance does not always mean that they're unable to care for the children or that, you know, mistreatment is inevitable. And so... Um, this is some information that comes from Health Canada's website, you know, and if you Google thinking about using cannabis while parenting, you'll get this really lovely guidance from um, the Canadians where uh, cannabis has been legal for um, adult use purposes since 2018, right? So what they're specifically guiding parents on is warning signs, right? That like, hey, if you're using cannabis, you might not be able to comfort your child as well. You might not recognize their cues for hunger. You might lose your you know, desire to play with them. Um, you might, might not be able to recognize when the, when the kiddo is in danger. Um, and so this is extremely sensible, you know, evidence-based um, information coming from the government of Canada. And so if we look at in general, I look to Canada as the laboratory of sensible drug policy. <laughs> so there's just some of the data that I talked about, you know, earlier, especially with the opioid use disorder and people who are using Suboxone. Um, that's all coming from the Canadians or, you know, a decade or two ahead of us in terms of, you know, what happens if we decriminalize drugs or what happens if we provide um, safe places or, or hygienic places to use drugs. Um, so, you know, if we look at what has happened in Canada since uh, federal legalization of cannabis, there has been no change whatsoever on the number of youths, so teenagers and young people who are using cannabis. It's the exact same rates of use of cannabis as before legalization. Um, there have been no impacts on impaired driving or traffic injuries. So the exact same number of traffic injuries and, and impaired driving um, are happening now as compared to prior to legalization. However, they have seen some huge reductions in drug-related arrests, including youth arrests, um, and a huge reduction in their criminal justice costs overall. So that's what's happened in Canada since they legalized cannabis. 
So if we could think about, you know, how how could we rely on the evidence to think about child welfare and child welfare policies? You know, the biggest thing we could focus on, the highest risk to children when it comes to cannabis is accidental ingestion. And, you know, preventing kids from eating cannabis um, is really a matter of parent education. If we teach parents, you know, how toxic and indeed how fatal um, cannabis can be to especially very young children, babies and toddlers. Um, if they understand the, the genuine toxic risks, then we can, you know, instill a culture of safety, provide suggestions for how to protect medical cannabis products from getting into the hands of kids, locking it up. The other thing that's really important to educate parents about is hemp derived products, right? So we talked about Delta 8 THC, lots of other cannabinoids and hemp derived products that, you know, are, are, are legal, are sold in gas stations, in, um, you know, uh, CBD shops or vapor shops or, um, you know, places where, um, you know, cannabis paraphernalia are sold, you know, on the internet, of course, um, you can get hemp, you know, impairing hemp derived products anywhere. Um, and so it's you know, a lot of people are consuming these products, not even realizing that they cause impairment. And that is really upsetting, right? If a person thinks that they're consuming a CBD hemp product, and they end up feeling very high, <laughs> you know, and they have to go to the emergency room or, you know, um, that, that's a really distressing experience. And so it's really important to, to educate parents that when in doubt, just assume that a hemp product is going to be impairing. Um, and the only way to verify that it's not going to be is by looking at a third party laboratory test. That's really the only way to, to ensure safety. Um, and importantly, talking to teens about cannabis, especially about concentrates and vaping. So inhaling vaporized um, cannabis oil from, you know, vapor cartridges or pens. Those are particularly um, uh, appealing to young people because they're so discreet, right? It used to be, you know, people of my generation, you know, that the kids would, you know, go off and the only way to consume cannabis was by smoking it, which is not at all discreet. So vaporizing, inhaling vaporized cannabis is a very discreet way to consume cannabis. Um, and in, in a lot of markets, um, those products are allowed to have flavors added to them, which enhance their palatability. They taste like strawberry or vanilla or, you know, peach or whatever. And so those flavors can enhance the abuse liability. So they become even more addictive because they taste nice. Um, so talking to kids about what responsible cannabis use looks like um, is an incredibly important thing that we can do for our families and children. Um, and once again, the Canadians are our saviors here. You know, the, the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy have put together this entire cannabis harm reduction package specifically for young people. Um, this effort is called Get Sensible. So if you Google Canadian Students for Sensible Drugs, Drug Policy Cannabis, Get Sensible, you know, you'll get this. There's all these like really beautiful, um, illustrated, very straightforward harm reduction approaches to um, talking to kids about cannabis and, and using cannabis responsibly as a young adult. Um, so, you know, you all are the experts in focusing on true signs of neglect. And if there's one takeaway that, you know, you could take from, from this discussion, it would be that not all cannabis use is a sign of neglect. You know, most people who use cannabis are incredibly care capable caretakers. Um, so that's just really important to keep in mind. Um, you know, some other evidence-based policies when we're thinking about the child welfare system and, and criminal justice is investing rather than in, you know, um, punitive treatments and incarceration, investing in prevention and family treatment plans and community partnerships, which, you know, um, compassionately support families in a long-term intergenerational approach, right? So preventing those um, intergenerational cycles of, of harm and substance use and mental health and health and wealth disparities, um, preventing those um, using a long-term approach rather than a short-term, uh, you know, you got caught using cannabis, we're going to sentence you to drug treatment, kind of that's a short-term, you know, solution to something that we should really be thinking about the overall lifespan of the, the kid who will soon be an adult in a you know, short amount of time. 
Um, so really it's just prioritizing stable families over, you know, um, this relatively black and white, you know, issue of law and order. Um, the other thing that, you know, we can think about is that, you know, for example, where we have uh, um, uh, uh, expungement days, right? Those expungement days um, for people who were previously convicted of drug offenses in states where cannabis is legal, those expungement days didn't just happen on their own. They came about because people advocated for them. And there are no better advocates for, you know, sensible evidence-based policy than the people who are within um, the child welfare system. So if we look at folks like the um, Drug Policy Alliance, who've done lots of advocacy for, you know, people who use cannabis and, and other substances, um, if we look at other um, cannabis advocacy groups like Normal or um, uh, Americans for Safe Access, you know, their emphasis certainly is not on families and child welfare. You know, they have a much bigger and broader agenda. So, um, you know, it, it could be worth considering that if these, if you think these policies are doing more harm than good, um, then getting involved in revising those policies, you know, there's no better advocate than the experts themselves on child welfare. Um, so where we can see that a policy can be updated to, to be in alignment with the evidence, we should definitely update that policies. And if those policies are hard to update and they're slow and it's a, a big bureaucratic system, you know, consider creative alternatives to think about, you know, how we can provide a more evidence-based approach. Okay. So in summary, cannabis use by parents does not always equal harm to the children and not all cannabis use is problematic use. It is often very responsible and totally legal. Um, caseworkers, you know, if you're interested in being able to, um, you know, detect cannabis misuse or problematic use for cannabis and other substance, then, you know, it might be worth considering getting that training that's required to recognize those, those things. Um, most of the policies that we have are drug war based. They're based in fear and categorical use of drugs as bad or immoral. Um, and those policies are not, they're just not aligned with the evidence. Um, and most importantly, you know, as we've seen in Oregon and in a lot of other places, it is just fiscally irresponsible to do um, drug screening. Um, there's, there's, not, there's not any utility. All it tells you is that a person did use cannabis in the last 30 days, and it doesn't actually predict anything else. Um, so it's really um, not a good use of resources to be investing in drug screening practices. Um, where we do have outdated policies, um, those things are indeed reinforcing health and wealth disparities, especially for people of color. Um, and so, again, if we have an opportunity to update it, then we should update the policy and we should get creative about how we go about doing that. Um, importantly, advocacy is required if you want to see especially these federal um, policy changes happen. Um, again, I'm no expert in these, you know, um, federal cannabis welfare policies, but there are plenty of folks out there who are. Um, so with that, you know, I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources that have supported me all through my career, which have been the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the Good Samaritan Foundation of Legacy Health. So thank you so much. Awesome. Just a, just a couple of things here in the last five minutes. This is kind of your last chance to ask burning questions. Um, and I think my takeaway from the questions is um, that people do want to be able to just distinguish between responsible use and and misuse, um, and and it's not simple. Like that training that you mentioned, yes, we want it, but that's not simple, right? I mean, maybe you could just speak to that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. And I myself don't have that training, so I can't personally speak from experience as to, you know, what, what that training even looks like, you know, but there are people who are qualified to diagnose a substance use disorder. They're usually addiction or mental health professionals. Um, and so, you know, I, I can totally see that this, this is exactly the problem, right? 
If we're concerned that a person might not be in the best place to be able to provide high quality care for a kiddo, how do we go about recognizing that? And I think that, you know, one thing that you could focus on is all the other ways that, you know, you recognize abuse and neglect. Um, so, you know, like, and again, you you all are the experts in this domain. So if you can take you know cannabis just out of the equation and look at the overall situation, is the situation problematic? That might help you get a little bit of clarity, you know, to sort of distance yourself from um, the the thoughts and the concerns and the complexity of cannabis to kind of focus on like, are there signs of neglect and and um, uh, mistreatment? I mean, it's almost like has harm can you can you verify that harm has been caused to the child and if you're not sure and you're it's just your opinion and you're up here somewhere in your head about it um you know then i would look more i hear you saying like look more deeply to see what's really going on in that family yeah i i think that's fair um i wanted to read a thank you here in the last mm -hmm. couple of minutes because Someone reached out and said, no question. I'm just here to say thank you for, for providing this current, accurate, and relevant information. I have advocated for years for medical cannabis in Florida for my son who has epilepsy and is currently a patient. I implore folks to please pay attention to the facts regarding cannabis and not stereotyping or assumptions or misconceptions. We must Get the feds to move on this. Voting matters. Amazing job, AD. Oh, so, wow. That's that was amazing feedback. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story with your family. You know, you're not alone. There, there are, you know, millions of people around the world who are using cannabis in their families to great benefit. Great. I'm glad to see the schools of thoughts are changing regarding this. Yes, we definitely need to get things moving in this area. Um, so lot there's been several different positive things and you know i think it's probably up to us to maybe step back and think about how do we get better at recognizing um responsible use from misuse in this area and uh following up and doing something about this because yeah we really want to where we can we want to keep kids with parents that they have and, and ensure that that's a safe and healthy um, situation for everybody involved. But we know that children um, often go through the child welfare system, for example, and then at 18, um, after being removed at an early age, they end up right back there on the doorstep of that parent. And so where we can, how can we help families stay together and help help them be their best possible selves and uh, and still honor that um, this is this is very complex and we shouldn't jump to any conclusions too early about it. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And you know, like the I I feel like if we if we take two examples out of the discussion today, you know, what is the easier thing to address? You know, recognizing problematic cannabis use is very complicated. You know, you have to have very close observation, spend a lot of time with a family or a parent. Whereas, you know, um, welfare investigations that are triggered by um, drug screening, that's a little bit more straightforward. So what I've observed over, you know, the course of my career and watching cannabis policies evolve on state and federal levels is it's always a story of incremental progress. You start with something that is small and achievable, and then slowly over time, one policy at a time shifts. Um, and then, you know, when you're looking back 10 years or 20 years, then, you know, things are very different. But being able to focus on something small and achievable and being okay with incremental progress, I think that's what I've observed in cannabis policy. Awesome. So you just opened a door and, uh, you know, we, we've stepped just one foot in, into it, but uh, we look forward to exploring this more. Thank you so much today for coming and talking with us and helping us get our, our heads wrapped around, you know, the fact that parents do use substances. And so what do we do to be our best selves to understand it? and honor that person and their best health alter, you know, the alternatives they can have for their best health and their family. So yeah. thank you so much.
Yeah, it was a real pleasure to be with you today. Thanks for the opportunity.